Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Just Infrastructure Speaker Series. And for those of you returning, welcome back. My name is Anita Chan, and along with Kara Karahalios and Indy Gupta, my fellow co-leads of the Just Infrastructures Initiative, we will be your hosts for today's event. We'll be live tweeting today's event using the hashtag Just Infrastructures as one word with a capital J and a capital I. For those of you who don't know us yet, Just Infrastructures is an initiative created by researchers to interrogate the complex interactions between people, algorithms, and AI-driven systems. You can learn more about us and see more info about our fall series of talks that will start in September at our website at just-infras.illinois.edu. A link has been added to the chat. We would like to thank our funders and sponsors, the Computer Science Department, the School of Information Sciences, Granger College of Engineering's SRI program, Capital One, and the Community Data Clinic for supporting this programming. We also have a long list of non-financial co-sponsors you can see on our website, and we would like to thank them as well. To ask a question, use the Q&A box. We will go through the questions at the end of the talk. Closed captioning and American Sign Language support is also available. Please use the chat to request any tech support and a note that this talk is being recorded. I'd like to now ask you to join me in a land acknowledgement. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists and the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose lands it is located. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Vea, Miami, Muscoutin, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kikapu, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Acknowledgements invite us to ask, what does it mean to live in a post and neo-colonial world? What did it take for us to get there? And how can we be accountable for our part in history? We'd now like to turn it over to our esteemed presenter. We are extremely honored to have Dr. Sasha Cassandra Chalk with us here today. Dr. Cassandra Chalk is a researcher and designer who works to support community-led processes that build shared power, move towards collective liberation, and advance ecological survival. They are known for their work on network social movements, transformative media organizing, and design justice. They are a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University, a senior research fellow at the Algorithm Justice League, and a steering committee member of the Design Justice Network. Sasha's newest book, Design Justice, Community-Led Practices to Build the Worlds We Need is available from MIT Press. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cassandra Chalk. Sasha, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anita, Carrie, and Trinell, and the ASL interpreters, and to all the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. And um, I want to start by acknowledging that even though we're meeting virtually, um, I'm on the lands of the Wampanoag, Pawtucket, and Massachusetts peoples. That's where I reside. And for those of you who have access to the chat, I encourage you to acknowledge the lands that you're on uh, in the chat, or if you're following along uh, via Twitter, you can do your acknowledgement there. And although the lands that we know now as the United States have been traversed by First Nations peoples for thousands of years. Today, they're fragmented by militarized borders. Despite the shift in presidential administrations, the rollout of technical infrastructure for the hyper surveillance of borders continues. And to take just one example, we could talk about documents gathered by a tech inquiry that revealed a Google Cloud contract to work with Anduril Industries surveillance tech on the so-called virtual border wall. So it's a partnership to develop cutting edge sensing, classification, AI decision support systems, and augmented reality user interface design in partnership with Customs and Border Patrol, the agency responsible for the forced separation of thousands of children from their parents for extended periods of time, hundreds of permanent separations, 
hundreds of thousands of detentions and deportations, deaths in custody, non-consensual invasive gynecological procedures, forced sterilizations, and myriad human rights abuses. And I think that we need to also talk about how the state development and use of advanced surveillance systems and automated decision support systems to separate indigenous, black, and working poor children from their families is only the latest instance of hundreds of years of white supremacist settler colonial activities that at least in public discourse in the United States or what's now known as the United States is only starting to be clearly recognized for what it is, genocide. And as a side note, I would encourage everyone to see the phenomenal recent documentary series, Exterminate All the Brutes. And so just recently, uh, this project, not my AI by the Brazil-based hacker feminist organization Coding Rights, led by Joana Varon and Paz Pena has launched. And it's an effort to develop a feminist toolkit to question algorithmic decision-making systems that are being deployed by the public sector with an initial focus in Latin America and the Caribbean. And one of the uh, case studies of this project is uh, Plataforma Tecnología de Intervención Social, or the um, technical platform for social intervention, also known as Project Horus, in Argentina and Brazil. And this is a teen pregnancy risk assessment scoring system developed through a public-private partnership. And in the report, Joana and Paz Pena talk about how critics of this system call it, quote, a lie an intelligence that does not think, a hallucination, and a risk for poor women's and children's sensitive data. And they also describe a technical analysis of the system's failures produced by the Laboratorio de Inteligencia Artificial Aplicada, the uh, lab for applied artificial intelligence at the University of Buenos Aires. And they analyzed the methodology that was posted on GitHub, um, by a Microsoft engineer, and they found that the results of this system have are rife with statistical errors in the methodology. The database, the database is biased. Um, they built and trained the system by asking people to report their own unwanted pregnancies. So you can imagine um, there are many reasons why people might not report that to a public agency. So the data collected and used to train is inadequate to make. Uh, effective future predictions, and it's likely to include pregnancies from some sectors of society over others. It's likely to stigmatize the poor, um, and it's likely to unevenly distribute the risk uh, of false assessment scores or predictions onto Black and Indigenous um, pregnant people. So, this is an example of, you know, I think we live in really disturbing times when historical systems of oppression are still continually being replicated across many domains of life throughout socio-technical systems development. But in this talk, I wanna focus on a sea change that I believe is taking place. I think that there's a growing sense that the often unintended harms of computing systems require us to slow down, to reevaluate, to consider societal and long-term impacts, and sometimes even to refuse to participate in certain kinds of work. So today, I'm hoping to share some of the ideas from my book, Design Justice, that I believe are useful to a longer-term project of making computing systems less harmful and developing our capacity to reimagine and to build the worlds that we need. So in the book, which was published about a year ago um, by the MIT Press, I offer an extensive reflection on questions about the relationship between design, power inequality, and liberation. And it's organized to chapters about design values. So I ask questions about what are the values that we encode and reproduce in the objects and systems that we design. I ask about design practices. So, um, you know, who gets to do design? 
and how do we move towards community control of design processes? There's a chapter about narratives, which is about what stories do we tell about how things are designed and how do we scope and frame design challenges? Design sites, which is questions about where do we do design and how do we make design sites more accessible to all of those who will be most impacted by design processes? And also what design sites do we privilege and talk about is like, this is a place where design happens. And what are the sites where design might be happening constantly, but they're ignored or marginalized or written out of official histories of how design work takes place. There's a chapter about design pedagogies. So how do we teach and learn um, about how we do design? And then finally, there's a, a section on um, emerging trends and possibilities for future work. And the book is freely available from the MIT Press. You can download it at design-justice.pubpub.org. And so today I'm gonna to be sharing some excerpts from the book, and then we're gonna have some time at the end for a conversation and Q&A. So, oops, sorry about that. So I'll begin in June of 2017. And I'm standing in the security line at the Detroit Metro Airport on my way back to Boston from the Allied Media Conference, a collaborative laboratory of media-based organizing that's held every year in Detroit for the past two decades. At the AMC, over 3,000 people, media makers and designers, activists and organizers, software developers and artists and all kinds of people gather every year to share ideas and strategies for how to create a more just, creative, and collaborative world. As a non-binary, trans, femme-presenting person, my time there is always deeply liberating. It's a conference that strives harder than any I know of to be deeply inclusive of all kinds of people, including queer, trans, intersex, and gender non-conforming folks, two-spirit folks. It's not perfect, and every year brings new challenges and difficult conversations about what it means to construct, to construct truly inclusive spaces, it's always a powerful experience. And so in June of 2017, I'm emerging from a week immersed in this parallel world. And I'm tired, but on a deep level, I'm refreshed. And my reservoir of belief in the possibility of creating better futures has been replenished. But I'm standing in the security line and coming closer to the millimeter wave scanner and my stress levels begin to rise beat speeds up slightly as I near the end of the line, because I know I'm about to be subject to an embarrassing, perhaps humiliating search by a TSA officer, because I know my body is about to be flagged as anomalous by the millimeter wave scanner. And I know that this is about to happen because of the particular socio-technical configuration of gender normativity, cis normativity, or the assumption that all people have a gender identity and presentation consistent with the sex we're assigned at birth. And that's been built into the scanner through a combination of user interface design, the scanning hardware, the binary gendered body shape data constructs, the risk detection algorithm, as well as the socialization and training of the TSA agents and the manual that they're supposed to follow. So a female presenting TSA agent motions me to step into the scanner and I raise my arms, you know, make the triangle, place, place my hands facing forward above my head, and the scanner spins around my body and the agent signals for me to step forward out of the machine and wait with my feet on the pad just past the scanner exit. I glance to my left where a screen displays an abstracted outline of the human body. And it looks like this, as you can see on this slide. And as I expected, a bright fluorescent yellow block on the diagram highlights my groin area. Because when I entered the scanner, the TSA operator on the other side was prompted by the user interface to select male or female. They literally have a blue boy button and a pink girl button that they're supposed to press, uh, depending on how they read you. And since my gender presentation non-binary femme, well, usually the operator selects female, but then the three-dimensional contours of my body at millimeter resolution 
differs from the statistical norm of female bodies as understood by the data set, by the risk algorithm, designed by the manufacturer of the scanner and its subcontractors, and as trained by an army of click workers tasked with labeling and classification, as scholars like Mary Gray and Lily Irani, who presented in the last Just Infrastructure's talk, remind us. So if the agent selects male, my breasts are large enough, statistically speaking, in comparison to the normative male body shape construct in the database, to trigger an anomaly warning. And it highlights my chest area. If they select a female, my groin area deviates from the norm enough to trigger the risk alert, and I get a bright yellow highlight around my groin. So in other words, I can't win. The socio-technical system is hardwired to mark me as risky, and that triggers an escalation to the next level in the security protocol. And that's exactly what happened in June of 2017 when I'm writing this story. So I get flagged. So the agent pulls me out, asks for my consent to a physical body search. And now that I'm close enough uh, to them, now they're confused about my gender and my sex. And that's another layer of problem because the next step in the TSA manual um, is if a pat down is performed, this is a quote, it will be conducted by an officer of the same gender as you present yourself." End quote. As a non-binary trans femme, I present a problem not easily resolved by the algorithm of the security protocol. They don't typically have a non-binary trans femme TSA officer hanging around to come do a consentful body search, which wouldn't be consented anyway, um, but it's required. So um, that situation continued to escalate. I ended up with two agents standing around me trying to figure out what to do and a long line of people watching. Um, and, you know, I'm now in public. I'm flanked by multiple agents. There's a line of curious travelers watching the whole interaction. And ultimately, you know, they pass their hands around my um, body and clear me to present onto my gate. The point of this story is to provide a small but concrete example from my own daily lived experience of how larger systems, including norms, values, and assumptions, are encoded in and reproduced through the design of socio-technical systems, or in political theorist Langdon Winner's famous words, how artifacts have politics. So we talked about how cis normativity is enforced through the scanning technology, the data sets, the risk assessment algorithm and operator practices, all designed based on the assumption that there are only two genders, that gender presentation conforms with so-called biological sex, and that every, anyone whose body doesn't fall within an acceptable range of deviance is flagged as risky and subject to a heightened and disproportionate burden of the harms, whether small or potentially large, of airport security systems and the violence of empire they instantiate. So queer and trans and gender non-conforming people are disproportionately burdened by the design of this tech and the way that it's used. The system is biased against us. Os Keys would call it a misgendering machine. Most cisgender people are unaware of the fact that millimeter wave scanners operate this way. And most trans folks know because it directly affects our lives. These systems, of course, aren't only biased against trans and gender nonconforming people. They're biased against Black people who frequently experience invasive searches of their hair, as documented by ProPublica, against Sikh men, Muslim women, and others who wear head wraps, as described by sociologist Simone Brown in her brilliant book, Dark Matters. As Brown discusses, and as Joy Bulamwini, founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, technically demonstrates, gender itself is racialized. Humans have trained our machines to categorize faces and bodies as male and female through lenses tinted by the optics of white supremacy. Airport security is also systematically biased against many disabled people who are flagged as risky if they have non-normative body shapes or if they use prostheses. And those who are simultaneously trans or gender nonconforming Black, Indigenous, or people of color, Muslim, immigrant, and or disabled 
are doubly, triply, or multiply burdened by, and therefore face the highest risks of harms from this type of system. So for example, my white skin, my US citizenship, and my institutional affiliations place me in a position of relative privilege. I'm going to be spared the most disruptive and harmful possible outcomes of security screening. So I don't have to worry that I'm going to be placed in a detention center or in deportation proceedings. And I'm definitely not going to be hooded and whisked away to Guantanamo Bay or one of the many other secret prisons that form part of the global infrastructure of the so-called war on terror. I probably won't even miss my flight while I'm detained for what security expert Bruce Schneier describes as security theater. So other people face much greater potential harms. Doesn't mean that it's fun, right? So here I wanna emphasize once again that the violent erasure of trans and gender nonconforming people isn't something new. It's not something that depends on technologies and artificial intelligence. It's been happening for hundreds of years under the ongoing project of settler colonialism. So cis normativity has been imposed on indigenous peoples throughout the Americas and around the world through centuries of violence, both spectacular and everyday. And this is an image of Vasco Nunez de Balboa in 1513, having his dogs devour 40 Cataqua third gender people from what's called today Panama. He read them as men in women's clothing, as diabolic, and so um, decided to violently kill them. First Nations Cree Two-Spirit scholar and activist Harlan Pruden and Mishnabeg theorist and writer Leanne Simpson, among many others, are systematically recovering these histories. So by grounding an analysis of cis-normative border security systems in hundreds of years of settler colonial violence, I wanna make it really clear that I'm not an advocate of a technical solution to the problems with millimeter wave scanners. So I'm not interested in making them less biased or fair and transparent. Simple inclusion or fixing the anomaly doesn't get at the underlying historical and structural problems. Instead, I'm asking us to think about how we might build a world where millimeter wave scanners don't exist, where they, like other border technologies and carceral systems and the violence of empire have been abolished. So like Harsha Walia, I'm interested in undoing border imperialism. And I'm interested in dismantling what Ruha Benjamin calls the new Jim Code, discriminatory design that amplifies racial hierarchies through engineered inequity, default discrimination, coded exposure, and techno benevolence. Ruha calls out how technology design frequently ignores and thereby replicates social divisions, or sometimes aims to fix racial bias but ultimately reproduces it. So I'm interested in decarceral design, decolonizing design, and design justice. So what is design justice? Well, uh, on the one hand, it's a framework for analysis of how the design of socio-technical systems influences the distribution of benefits and burdens between various groups of people. And in particular, Design justice focuses very explicitly on how design might reproduce or challenge the matrix of domination. And the matrix of domination is a term developed by black feminist scholar, sociologist, and past president of the American Sociological Association, Patricia Hill Collins, to refer to race, class, and gender as interlocking systems of oppression. So it's a conceptual model that we can use to think about power and oppression, privilege and penalties, benefits and burdens, and their systematic distribution between different groups of people. So when she talks about the term in her book, Black Feminist Thought, she emphasized race, class, and gender as three systems that historically have been most important in structuring most Black women's lives. But she also notes we could extend to include any and all systems of oppression that mutually constitute each other and shape our lives. So we could add disability, immigration status, language, and so on and so forth. So 
Um, today, I want to talk a little bit about how this framework can relate to some of the core concepts in human computer interaction, affordances. So according to the Interaction Design Foundation, affordances are, quote, an object's properties that show the possible actions users can take, thereby suggesting how they may interact with that object. So for instance, a button can look as if it needs to be turned or pushed. The term affordance was developed in the late 1970s by cognitive psychologist James Gibson. And it came to be influential in many fields following design professor William Gaber's article, Technology Affordances. And then it moved into even wider use in HCI following the publication of cognitive scientist and interface designer Donald Norman's book, The Design of Everyday Things. So for Norman, affordance refers to the perceived and actual properties of the thing, primarily those fundamental properties that determine just how the thing could possibly be used. So a chair affords sitting, a doorknob affords turning, a mouse affords moving the cursor on the screen and clicking, and a touch screen affords tapping and swiping. Oh, sorry about that. So the design of everyday things, it's a canonical text. It's full of useful insights and compelling examples, but it also entirely ignores race, class, gender, disability, and other axes of inequality. So at one point, Norman states that capitalism has shaped the design of objects, but he says it in passing and he never relates it to the key concepts of the book. Race and racism appear nowhere. He uses the term women once in a passage that describes the amphitheater Louise Laird in the Paris Sorbonne where, quote, the mural on the ceiling shows lots of naked women floating about a man who was valiantly trying to read a book. Gay, lesbian, trans, none of those terms appear. Disability is barely discussed. There's a brief section titled Designing for Special People. And it's a three-page passage where Norman describes the problems designers face in designing for left-handed people and urges the reader to consider the special problems of the aged and infirm the handicapped, the blind or near blind, the deaf or hard of hearing, the very short or tall or the foreign. And so by framing it that way, Norman is firmly subscribing to the individual medical model of disability. It locates disability in quote, well, in defective bodies as problems to be solved. Rather than the social relational model that recognizes how society actively disables people with physical or psychological differences, functional limitations or impairments through unnecessary exclusion instead of taking action to meet people's access needs, let alone the disability justice model created by disabled black indigenous and POC as they fight to dismantle able-bodied supremacy as a key axis of power within the matrix of domination. So, uh, Norman does provide a footnote about a multilingual voice message system, another one about typewriter keyboards and the normalization of the English language and Roman characters. But in general, the book is a compendium of designed objects that are difficult to use, that does provide key principles for better design, but almost entirely ignores questions about how race, class, gender, disability, and other aspects of the matrix of domination might shape or constrain access to affordances. Design justice, in contrast, is an approach that asks us or invites us to focus sustained attention on these questions, starting with how does the matrix of domination shape affordance, perceptibility, and availability? So first, we might ask, whether any given affordance is equally perceptible to all people, or whether it systematically privileges some kinds of people over others. Affordance perceptibility is always shaped by our standpoint, our location within the matrix of domination. Every affordance is more perceptible to some kinds of users than to others. And second, design justice impels us to consider whether a given affordance is equally available to all people. So for example, stairs 
afford moving between two levels of a home for most people, but deny that affordance to those whose form of mobility makes stairs difficult or impossible to use. So for those users, stairs might be a perceptible but unavailable affordance. An audible alert that announces the arrival of an instant message might enhance perception of the affordances of the IM client for some users, including those who can hear the alert, those who have an application minimized in the background, those who are away from the computer while engaged in another task that occupies visual attention, but it offers no perceptual advantages to other users, those who are deaf or hard of hearing or who have their computers muted. And so as human computer interaction turns increasingly to interactions based on machines detecting, parsing, and predicting human intentions like facial recognition or emotion classification or voice control and natural language processing, we have to pause and think about how affordances are never equally perceptible to all, never equally available to all. Design justice brings that insight to the fore and asks us for more intentionality when we think about how, whether we want our work to contribute to dismantling or reproducing existing inequalities in the distribution of designed benefits and burdens. We could also talk about design disaffordances, which match perceptual cues with actions that will be blocked or constrained. So in a paper about discriminatory design, D.E. Whitcower, who's a philosopher of technology, provides examples of disaffordances like a fence disaffords entry to a plot of land, a lock on a door disaffords entry without a key, and a fingerprint scanner on a mobile phone affords access to the phone's content to the owner and disaffords access to others. And Whitcower also identifies what he calls uh, disaffordances with a Y. So disaffordances are a subcategory of disaffordances, which are objects that require some users to misidentify ourselves to access the functions. So for example, as a non-binary person, I experience a disaffordance with a Y anytime I interact with a system like air travel ticketing that forces me to select either male or female to proceed. While a graduate student at MIT, Joy Bolomwini experienced the disaffordances of facial detection technology. It failed to detect her dark skinned face until she donned a white mask. And that led her to systematically study bias in facial analysis tech and found the algorithm Justice League. So design justice asks us to constantly consider the distribution of affordances, disaffordances, and disaffordances for the why. Uh, between different kinds of people. Here I want to emphasize that design justice isn't about imposing a single best design solution. It's about recognizing that design privileges some people over others and making those decisions more intentional. And in particular, we might ask ourselves, do the affordances of a system or an object that I'm designing disproportionately reduce opportunities for already oppressed groups of people while enhancing the life opportunities of dominant groups. And here I wanna add a side note about what I call the paradox of personalization because empirical studies support a pretty strong critique of the idea that the same design is best for all users. So for example, Reinecke and Bernstein found that most users preferred a user interface customized according to cultural differences. And they noted that it's not possible to design a single interface that appeals to every user. So they argued instead for the design of culturally adaptive systems. And that's definitely a promising approach. But in practice, it can often lead to the reproduction and reification of existing social categories through algorithmic surveillance tracking users across sites, gathering and selling their data without consent, the development of filter bubbles. So if universalization erases difference and produces self-reinforcing spirals of exclusion, but personalized and culturally adaptive systems 
are too often deployed in ways that reinforce surveillance capitalism. So for example, Fight for the Future and others just recently organized a campaign against Spotify's proposed and patented audio surveillance system, ostensibly a helpful personalization, but also unconsented surveillance and a harmful category imposition, a stereotype reification and context collapse. So this slide shows um, Spotify's patent um, for how they're going to um, passively take in audio from the phone, um, filter it, do speech recognition, retrieve content metadata like emotional state, gender, age, accent, normalize the content, retrieve environmental metadata like the environment you're in, the social environment, are you alone, are you with a small group, are you at a party, and thereby recommend appropriate music for you. Um, I want to highlight the retrieve content metadata and classify it by emotional state, by gender, is for me a giant nope. Um, so taking people's voice and assuming that you can uh, classify the gender, presumably into a binary, um, is not something we should be encouraging. So um, there isn't a solution to this paradox. Instead, I think that design justice urges us to recognize that we're always making intentional decisions about which users we choose to center and hold us accountable for those choices. So community accountability, control, and ownership of design processes is the topic of chapter two in the book. And I think I need to move forward here. So um, definitely check out uh, Fight for the Future's campaign uh, around Spotify. And this is an image of uh, fight Evan Greer from uh, Fight for the Future who developed this image and uh, a video and a bunch of uh, interactive materials around uh, this campaign. So moving on, I want to emphasize that design justice isn't a term that I created. It emerged from a community of practice. So there's no design justice theory or practice without the Design Justice Network organizers, especially Una Lee, Victoria Barnett, Wes Taylor, Denise Shante Brown, and many, many, many other people uh, who've been involved in growing a community of design practitioners who are working with social movements and community-based organizations across the United States and around the world. And there's many other um, overlapping communities of practice that are also doing aligned work. Uh, like the Decolonizing Design Group, uh, the Data Feminist Networks, Afrofuturist Speculative Designers like Alondra Nelson, Pluriversal Designers like Arturo Escobar, and, and so many more. But the network that I'm most part of is the Design Justice Network, which was created at the Allied Media Conference starting in the summer of 2015 um, at a workshop called Generating Shared Principles for Design Justice, planned by Una Lee, Jenny Lee, and Melissa Moore, and presented by Una Lee and Wes Taylor. And following that workshop, uh, it kind of, um, this, those set of principles were sort of collated and then released in 2016. Um, and since then, uh, that network has just been growing and growing. So I'm going to share the principles, um, and then we'll sort of close it out and get into the, the Q&A. So these are the principles that the Design Justice Network operates by. They came out of, they came out of this collaborative you know, development process. So principle one, we use design to sustain, heal, and empower our communities, as well as to seek liberation from exploitative and oppressive systems. Principle two, we center the voices of those who are directly impacted by the outcomes of the design process. Principle three, we prioritize design's impact on the community over the intentions of the designer, because we know where good intentions can lead. Principle four, we view change as emergent from an accountable, accessible, and collaborative process rather than only as a point at the end of the process. 
principle five, we see the role of the designer as a facilitator rather than an expert. And principle six, we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience. And we all have unique and brilliant contributions to bring to the design process. Principle seven, we share design knowledge and tools with our communities rather than always acting as gatekeepers. Principle eight, we work towards sustainable, community-led and controlled outcomes. Principle nine, we work towards non-exploitative solutions that reconnect us to the earth and to each other. Here we could have a conversation about the boom in NFTs and art markets, um, but maybe we'll get to that in the Q&A. Principle 10, before seeking new design solutions, we look for what's already working at the community level. We honor and uplift traditional, indigenous, and local knowledge and practices. So since we released these principles back in, um, developed in 2015, released in 2016, um, after a long you know, process of revisions, the network has really been growing, nurtured by many people. There are now more than 1,200 signatories to the principles, more than 450 members who commit monthly time or money to support the network's growth, local nodes that are self-organizing in cities around the United States and around the world. There's uh, a zine series that we produce, there's working groups, um, there's a steering committee. Um, that's interesting. Thought I was gonna move to this slide. Um, so yeah, so these images are some of the activities of the network with local nodes, with zines, with different meetings, workshops that are being produced and released. Um, and I encourage people to get involved with the Design Justice Network. You can learn more at designjustice.org. Um, of course, I also mentioned that there are many other uh, values aligned groups. It's not just the DJN that's working in these ways. So there's groups like the Equity-Centered Community Design Framework from Creative Reaction Lab. Um, they're uh, in the field of architecture and urban planning. There is the Design as Protest uh, Collective of Architects and City Planners. They emerged in 2017, um, and they have focused on design justice demands for the built environment. And I really encourage people to check those out, especially if they're involved in um, yeah, architecture and planning. Um, and there's a lot happening in computing. So there's a flood of excellent work, both inside and outside the academy, that is explicitly rethinking computing through Black, queer, feminist, anarchist, green, disability justice, and other strands of liberatory thought and practice um, with roots in social movements. Um, the slide shows uh, a few recent reports about building consentful technology, um, about how it takes more than code to build an equitable um, tech ecosystem, and about um, pathways through the portal of emerging technologies in the public interest. So those are projects that I worked on, but there's, there's so much more happening, right? So I mentioned Ruha Benjamin's work um, on race after technology. Um, no, I was going to talk more about these, but I do want to get to Q&A, so I'll just kind of highlight a few. So there's Safia Noble's book, Other Algorithms of Oppression, um, focusing our attention on how search algorithms misrepresent marginalized subjects. And that starts with her own lived experience of the circulation of hypersexualized images of Black girls and women. Um, there's Mary Gray and Siddharth Suri's book, Ghost Work about how the seemingly smooth user experience of AI depends on the work of a huge invisibilized human labor force. Uh, there's Virginia Eubanks' book, Automating Inequality, about how algorithmic decision support systems punish poor people as part of a right-wing strategy to limit and roll back hard-fought access to social welfare programs um, that were originally won by poor people's movements. Um, there's data feminism, by Catherine Ignacio and Lauren Klein. And they encourage us to examine and challenge power in data processes, elevate emotion and embodiment, 
rethink binaries and hierarchies, embrace pluralism, consider context and make labor visible. And in one of the other hats that I wear, I'm a senior research fellow with the Algorithmic Justice League, um, where we are working to develop uh, not only technical analyses based on you know, intersectional training data and tests and benchmarks for machine learning systems, like uh, Bula Mwini's work together with uh, Deb Raji and Tiffany Kabru around facial analysis software performing worst on women with darker skin tones, but also we're working for greatly increased public oversight of these systems. So Joy likes to say, if you have a face, you have a place in the conversation. If you have a voice, you have a choice. And outside the academy, there's also so much happening. There's the Tech Won't Build It movement, the Carceral Tech Resistance Network, the Our Data Bat Bodies Project, the No Tech for ICE campaign led by Mi Gente, um, Google Walkout for Real Change. So I began the talk by noting that there's a sea change taking place. Um, there's a shift in public conversation and understanding of these systems. Uh, you can go to Netflix and watch Coded Bias um, that go, dives into um, you know, a, a number of the authors that I just uh, mentioned are in there talking about Joy's journey from personal experience to congressional testimony and what it's going to take to build oversight of these systems. There's new local coalitions like Lily Irani's work that she talked about last time um, in San Diego, um, not only fighting individual surveillance systems, but creating public accountability mechanisms for community oversight. So we're in a moment of great transformation. The questions that design justice is asking are hard questions, but they're necessary ones. And I think that, um, I hope that more people, more and more sectors ask those questions so that we can transform our practices inside institutions and outside of them uh, and build a world where many worlds fit, as the Zapatistas would say. Thank you. That was wonderful, Sasha. Um, a huge virtual applause um, that we'll trend, admit, attempt to admit through the webinar. Um, so we now have time for audience questions um, and you can still send us your questions via the Q&A box. Kara Kara Halios and I will moderate um, and I'll read aloud our first question um, from the audience, uh, which comes from um, Gabe Mallow, who, who says um, or asks, in a virtual space that is increasingly dominated by surveillance capitalism, how would we be able to effectively hold those companies operating according to the design justice standards that you just outlined um, and make them accountable for the design choices that they make and the people that they tacitly or explicitly exclude? Where is there room for effective resistance within this environment or in this situation where we just have to build entirely anew? Um, I think it's a it's a yes and to that question. So we're going to need every possible strategy, um, which includes building new alternative uh, systems, um, as well as generating public conversation so that more and more people become aware of how these systems operate. Uh, that, that can happen um, through you know, media production and circulation. Um, it can happen through social movement activity. And we are also going to need regulatory action. Um, there are some very promising developments on the regulatory side. So, for example, uh, in the last year or so, we've seen a wave of municipal bills passing to provide some limitations and accountability, and in a few cases, bans um, on certain surveillance systems. And I highly recommend Lily Irani's talk from last week. I already mentioned it several times, but because, you know, she really describes how you know, it moves from just being like a technology by technology conversation to like, how do we create more democratic and accountable local mechanisms for public oversight uh, of systems deployment? Um, and that's possible. And they were successful in San Diego at doing that. Also at the federal level, we've now got the, um, we've got federal legislation for the first time that would potentially uh, ban or place a moratoria on facial recognition technology and other uh, biometric surveillance. Um, in the European Union uh, context, I was just on a call earlier today discussing the proposed um, digital services 
um, platform regulation um, law, which includes mechanisms for that require third party auditing of uh, powerful large platforms. So yeah, we need um, small and local actions as well as regulatory action. And then inside the companies, I think that we need more people who are working inside the large companies to push for shifts and for changes and for more accountable development processes. Um, and there is some possibility of institutional transformation from inside the companies, um, as well as building alternatives. The next question is from Chibundu Aguatu. She asks, I'm really interested in how fintech design is working to reproduce ideas of who should be able to make money and how through financial theories of risk, especially around sex workers, queer creators, and or creators of color. Do you have thoughts on design justice practices and fintech platform development? That is a great question. Um, I have not spent a lot of time you know, working on fintech and analyzing it and exploring it, but um, I can tell you that I have, I've been following the conversation around NFTs, for example, um, non-fungible tokens. So there's been a recent uh, boom in the art world of artists releasing um, digital artworks on the blockchain, um, auctioning them, selling them. And one of the big pushbacks in that space has been the extremely high environmental costs uh, of proof of work approaches to uh, NFTs. Um, so there is maybe some recognition that um, using massive amounts of energy to uh, develop and circulate digital artworks is not a sustainable um, or just solution. We know from the environmental justice movement and the climate justice movement that the impacts of um, ecological devastation um, produced through uh, you know, energy use, among other activities, um, fall disproportionately on the global south, two thirds world, um, black and indigenous communities. Um, so we need to shift at the very least from you know, proof of work to proof of stake approaches, if that's even a thing that is useful to do. Um, so I would love to see, and I'd be love to hear about others who are doing deeper dives into how the design justice principles might inform fintech more broadly um, and NFTs and other approaches to um, getting content creators paid more specifically. The next question is from Jane Pio, who asks, I'm curious about the Western ideals made default and normalized and reproduced through technology design. My example is computer keyboards, for instance, that naturally assume the use of Romanized alphabets, whereas many other languages do not use but have to adapt um, to these keyboards by typing how the word sounds in English, for instance. How can design justice address this kind of Western default in technology design? Yeah, so I think that um, design justice would definitely have a critique of um, the normalization of Romanized alphabets and the allocation of resources to keyboard design, you know, along those lines, um, and would encourage us to, to, first of all, to look at the long history of people creating alternative, you know, keyboard designs and other ways of thinking about, um, you know, interface with computers, um, including those that aren't necessarily based on keyboards. Um, so again, starting from the idea that wherever people have been excluded or marginalized from a design process, there's always um, some people coming up with solutions and proposals and alternatives. I think there's a lot of work in this space already. And so a design justice approach would probably start from saying, well, okay, what community are you working with? Who are you most interested in, in terms of like, who's being excluded? Um, what language community? Um, what scripts are being excluded? Um, in the context that you're personally working in. Um, and then what work has already been done in that space that you could draw from um, to help get people access to um, other types of keyboards and input devices. And that's like the thing that we each can do at a local and individual level within any de design process. But design justice also asks us 
to always be asking that question about like, okay, but, and also to what are the larger structures that have developed this standardization, this normalization, that have invested larger amounts of resources into this particular approach that privileges some over others, what would need to happen to shift that? Um, so what would it mean to push um, you know, federal governments to allocate um, design and technology development budgets differently? What, what does it take to move budgets around inside companies as they think about you know, who they're designing for? Um, and how can people working on design connect with social movements, uh, people who don't necessarily identify as designers, but are interested in reimagining the world and its affordances um, and use the special skills or networks that we might have access to, to support community-led processes for building those alternatives. And the next question is from Shami Young. She asks, um, thank you, Sasha, exclamation mark. Could you tell us more about the paradox of universalization and personalization? Is the problem of universality necessarily the problem of scale or scale as thinking? And is there an appropriate level of scale with which we ought to design? By advocating for the community-driven and local scale design approach, does that mean we limit our desire to scale it up to the broader audience? Or is there a way for design justice to scale up above the community level? It's a really great question. Um, yes, I definitely think that scale and scaleless thinking, um, as you put it, is, is a key uh, problem. And part of the imperative to scale comes from the logic of profitability. So if we've organized our entire system of sort of the production of socio-technical systems optimized around the maximization of profit and profit logics, in order to get away from the immediate assumption that scalability is always one of the most important requirements. Um, that may take a broader systems transformation um, away from a capitalist system so that people's time and energy and resources and priorities um, are being structured uh, according to other values or logics um, um, like like localization and localist thinking, like true, you know, sustainability um, with all the costs that are externalized under capitalist logic, re-internalized into the design and production process, um, and so on and so forth. Of course, some I, I believe that there are always some systems that do, we, we do need to operate at larger scale. So we could talk about vaccine development and distribution would be you know, a great example. So we wouldn't necessarily want a world where um, everybody is left to develop a local, you know, customized vaccine when we're hit with a new, you know, pandemic. Um, so um, I guess the short version of this part of the answer is that it's also contextual. Um, I think we need to question the assumption that everything should be scalable. Um, and then when systems do need to be scaled, um, to keep asking those questions about who's going to benefit the most, who's going to be burdened, who's included and excluded um, through that scale process and make that decision making intentional rather than just unquestioned or undiscussed because the unmarked always means reproducing the existing um, structures of power, white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, capitalism and settler colonialism and ableist supremacy. The next question is from Melissa Osipek, who writes, thank you for this wonderful talk and for highlighting so many resources. I would love to hear more about how you're thinking about the relationship between research and advocacy and research institutions and advocacy. Sure, so, um, I mean, for me personally, um, I consider myself a community engaged researcher um, and designer. So a lot of my own you know, research work has always been done um, in community with community-based organizations, with social movement organizations. Um, I believe in developing sort of long-term lasting um, partnerships. I believe in people from 
um, affected communities leading research. Um, at the institutional level, you know, I guess I encourage uh, students that I work with. So for example, I teach a collaborative design studio. Um, and in that course, the students partner with community-based organizations to develop um, design projects. They develop, they develop briefs. Sometimes they develop prototypes or sometimes just proposals. Um, and part of that is really about getting them to think about um, spending time with an organization and the people in the organization, getting to know each other as humans, eating together, um, doing, volunteering to take on the small tasks that make social movement activity and community-based work um, function. Like, yeah, I'll help cook or clean up. Or so like the specialized research and design skills that you may have are valuable. But if you move beyond a transactional relationship where you're just like, I'm here to extract a design lesson from you, um, it means creating relationships with people, learning about what people want and need and care about. Um, and not only because it's something that you can then go and publish about, but because you value one another um, based on lived experience and as humans. And then over time, um, there may be places where the particular skills that you have are valuable to build on or amplify or support some process that's um, emerged organically from that community organization or from that movement network. And institutionally, there are also ways to structure that. So for example, I encourage people, uh, and in my own practice, um, let's say that I get a, a grant support to do a community-based research or design project. I'm always gonna build in a line item to that grant where I make it clear that part of the money is gonna go to the community partner um, so that people are resourced to be able to fully participate in the research process or the design or prototyping process. Um, we're gonna think about accessibility. We're gonna think about food. Um, we're gonna think about childcare. Um, we're gonna think about what are the things that we need to do to create a process um, where um, people whose first goal isn't to produce a piece of academic writing or to produce a designed prototype um, can actually be resourced and have their access needs met to meaningfully participate um, in thinking through the thing we're going to do together. Um, and the last question um, is from Gabriela Garcia. Looking at the three years between establishing the design justice principles and formalizing the structure network, what were some of the significant decisions and challenges that facilitated the successful arc toward establishing something more concrete and amorphous? Um, well, I would say that that is still an ongoing process. Um, so the that first workshop was in 2015. Um, then the principle, the draft principles were revised and then released in their current form in 2016. Um, from there, the Design Justice Network, um, so it went from being just a small workshop with 30 people. Then the following year, there was what's called network gathering at that live media conference. So we invited many of the people who had been involved in developing those principles and expanding them um, to come back and gather again to release them. And then the following year, um, the network gathering evolved into a full track within the Allied Media Conference. So a track is where you know we had both the gathering uh, where all the signatories were invited, as well as a series of hands-on workshops that took place throughout the multiple days of the conference. Um, so basically it grew organically from one workshop to a network gathering, to a track and a gathering. And it wasn't until I think the third year that we started to really have more activities beyond what took place at the Allied Media Conference. So at that point, there started to be so many more people coming in and inspired by the principles and getting connected um, that we decided to start organizing more regular uh, meetings and Zoom calls and that type of thing. Um, the following year, we produced the zine on how to organize a local node of the Design Justice Network. And we then released that zine at, um, at the next year's Allied Media Conference. So in year three or maybe four, where we encourage people to start organizing locally to figure out what the principles meant for them in their particular you know, um, context. So it's just been growing organically. Um, we also made a decision to not seek 
any grant money until we had a lot of things uh, figured out about the network. So um, right now the, the revenue for the network is all coming through um, membership fees. And we just actually released a report, our first annual report um, that describes sort of the activities of the network over the past year um, and the budgeting. And we're now launching the participatory budgeting process. Um, so far, you know, the, the fees are mostly supporting um, a network coordinator position, um, which is a part-time position so far, um, and some travel and accessibility needs for people. Um, and we're trying to figure out um, as the network now grows, um, you know, how do we budget in ways that follow our own principles and can better support um, the needs of, of the network and the local nodes and working groups. So I encourage and invite people to get involved. Um, you can join the network over at designjustice.org. Um, we have mailing lists and we have you know, chat rooms and we have regular meetings and workshops. And um, hopefully in the near future, we'll be able to start having physical convenings again. Thank you, Sasha. That was just wonderful. Um, we now just want to um, take a, a moment um, to thank our production team um, and to invite them also to re-video, um, as none of this would be possible without the back-end work of Mitchell Oliver, Jingyi Gu, Vinay Koshi, Gabe Mallow, Adrian Wong, Cheyenne Putz, Putz, Katie Pearson, and our ASL translators, Dee Kroner and Nick Shell from UIUC's DREZ office. Thank you, thank you all. Um, we're enormously grateful for the time you spent with us. Um, and, uh, and we also wanna thank you, our audience, for all joining us today. A recording of this talk, as well as a link shared in our chat today will be posted to our website. You can join us again next September when our speaker series resumes for its fall lineup, beginning with MacArthur Fellow, Mary Gray, and continuing with Martin Wattenberg and Fernanda Viegas in October and Shoshana Zuboff in November. We hope to see you there. Thank you all again. Thank you so much.